You're listening to Power Talks with Beth Ann and Melody Caesarstrom in the morning, where talk is real, truth is in the talk, and there is power in truth. And today is Thanksgiving Day, and Melody and I are here to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And we're putting together a special show for you today so that uh, hopefully it'll keep you in the spirit and keep your mind um, focused on thankfulness. And what today really is, uh, maybe bring you a chuckle, maybe bring you a tear, but uh, a little bit of history, but just to kind of keep you focused, because I'm certain that chaos has begun where you are today. Good morning, Melody. Happy Thanksgiving. Good morning, and happy Thanksgiving to you and all our wonderful listeners uh, in America. Good morning. Happy Good Thanksgiving. Morning. Is everybody, is everyone smelling their turkey today? Oh, I bet it is. I bet they're starting to smell that turkey. <laughs> Either that or they're knee deep in it, you know, elbow deep in the turkey as they're stuffing it. Now, lots of people don't stuff the turkey, but I do. And I have a little turkey poem. We'll start out with a little turkey poem. How's that? Okay. The funny po- it's a funny bird. A turkey is a funny bird. Its head goes wobble, wobble. All it knows is just one word, gobble, gobble, gobble. <laughs> I know you appreciate me a lot, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need this. Yes. I uh, I heard last night where they were warning people because of all the um, all the things that have been happening in the news today, and we don't well, want to really. That's the end of the poem. Time. That was the end of the poem. Oh. Yes, it was very short and sweet, don't you think? <laughs> yes. It was. You could memorize that. The turkey is a funny bird. His head goes wobble, wobble. All he knows is just one word: gobble, gobble, gobble. <laughs> Yes, that was the end of the poem. <laughs> anyway, they were talking yesterday um, evening about being careful with, you know, because of all the uh, accusations and harassment and uh, allegations that are going out across this land from Hollywood to D.C. Um, about the children and hugging the relatives. And I thought, how sad that we have come to that point in our time where you have to warn a child not to hug a relative. And uh, I don't think the, the, I don't think the danger there is hugging the children. I think it's the people who thought that is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, really. You know, it, it's it's. Um, they were just talking about a lot of um, uh, um, assaults or a lot of. Uh, sexual assaults that actually come from family. That's true. And so they were just warning of the little girls, don't force them to hug someone if they don't want to hug them. You know, they haven't seen Uncle So-and-so for five years. And uh, anyway, I thought that was really sad that we've come to that. Really, really sad. But. And that really is true. But you know what this reminds me of, and I wonder how much of this is going on with the sexual, sexual harassment. Mm-hmm. Remember, oh, I don't know, 25 years ago, maybe even longer, when all of a sudden you had these uh, children who were saying they were being molested by their parents, and they come to find out that not all of it, I mean, much of it was true, but a lot of it was also these children were kind of being led by the particular questions they were asked. Yes, yes, I do um, remember that. That they didn't, that the parents really weren't, they were not molesting uh, the children at all. Uh, Mm -hmm. But, you know, the children were saying, yeah, you know, and so forth. And I wonder if there isn't a little bit of that psychology that's going on today with this uh, sexual harassment. And I'm thinking particularly of of Roy Moore when you have a 14-year-old and she's now 50 years old plus, um, how much of that has been, you know, guided her into saying things that might or might not have happened? And uh, so this is how they do things. You know, they yeah. have an agenda, uh, and they'll use these various points and so forth. But uh, I didn't want to take it to that I mean, we're here about Thanksgiving, so Wait, but we are. I just wanted to. I had re- I had also years and years ago talked about how old I am. On on Johnny Carson one night, they were talking about the children when they uh, they get a little grumpy, you know, have a few meltdowns, 
um, that a lot of times it's their blood sugar level and you, they have to wait to eat. You know, the eating schedule is completely and totally off during the holiday season. And um, <clears throat> said to have crackers and cheese something for them that's substantial so that you can just give them a little something to because it is because they and I have a grandson that actually does he really does melt down he we call it hangry he gets hangry he's got to have his food he's got to have something in his tummy or he gets hangry I've got a couple of them actually like that and uh, so you do have to as a parent or, or even a grandparent be understanding and know that their little bodies process a lot differently than ours and so, you know, have some snacks that are substantial, not not candy snacks, but some cheese and crackers or maybe a little, you know, a little summer sausage or something that'll that'll help tie them over and keep them in good spirits <laughs> through, through the day so that you don't have to deal with the meltdown. Well, I want to go back to Turkey, if I may. Sure. Go back to talking about turkeys. Turkey. If someone doesn't know the, if people don't know this already, because I'm sure it was all over the news and everything, but it's worth mentioning today. We had uh, President Trump pardon drumstick. He yes. was this he was this year's winner. He gained he garnered sixty percent support over his rival Wishbone, who only earned forty percent. So it was Drumstick who on Tuesday afternoon in the White House Rose Garden received a presidential pardon from Donald Trump. And I guess this has been going on for a while, but uh um Wishbone, very pretty turkey. Very pretty, I very big it. one. I've got yeah, a picture of thirty six pounds. Mm. You know, that could take a lot of stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, we buy a bigger turkey every year because I actually stuff the bird. And so the bigger the turkey, the bigger the cavity, the more the stuffing, and that's what it's all about. Well, I have a little bio, a little information on drumstick. I didn't know if you had that or not. I bet I do, but why don't you go ahead and I'll, I'll compare <laughs> it with mine. His date of birth mm-hmm. was June 28th, 2017. Yes. Uh, his strut style is tall and proud. His favorite music is classic rock, and he is 31 inches tall. His overall weight is 47 pounds. That is a big turkey. <laughs> and his wingspan is 5 foot, and his favorite band is Journey. Mm-hmm. So I guess he's going to have a little journey in his life with that pardon that the president gave him. Yes. Actually, the one that was 36 pounds was Wishbone, and he didn't, okay. he didn't fare so well. Well, he didn't get pardoned? Only one turkey got pardoned? I believe so. I think that's the way it works. <laughs> well, I hate to say this, Obama saved both of them last year. <gasps> did he? He did. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Were they yes. illegal immigrants? Okay, I should. Yeah, pretty, yeah. <laughs> They were from Mexico. Well, you know, there's a little history in the pardoning of the turkey that goes back to Missouri with the uh, President Truman. Um, I was trying to think where it talked about. President Truman did not pardon the turkey. <laughs> President Truman ate the turkey, I do believe. He was served on the uh, on the uh, White House table. But uh, then they started uh, um, pardoning the turkey shortly after that but it had it was i i don't have what i had last year i i had the whole history of it it was really fascinating how it started out and they come and they present these turkeys i mean it is elaborate how they present these turkeys for pardoning when they bring them to the white house uh so you know how they make their little houses or how they make their little presentations you know just like uh Talking about wishbone and and, uh, and um, talking about uh, um, drumstick as to what their favorites are, their date of birth, and um, I was going to say, what does it say about wishbone was born same day? Um, his strut style is strong shuffle, and he has he loves country music. Twenty inch, twenty eight inches tall, only thirty six pounds, and four foot eight inches is his wingspan. And Tim McGraw and Faith Hill are his favorite his, his favorite artists, the band. <laughs> but anyway, it was kind of fascinating how they do that. And I believe it was the first uh, George Bush that said reprieve. And so that's how they got started 
well, that's not exactly when they got started. They did it before then, but the, the word... The word took off from that. But uh, President Truman did not pardon the turkey. He ate the turkey. <laughs> Leave it to Missouri. Mm, Leave it yes. to Missouri. Leave it to Missouri. So. Well, you know, if you go back to history about the first Thanksgiving, um, the, it varies in dates and reasons and when it was actually official and so forth. But if we go back to the earliest of uh, 1621, um, then most likely they didn't have turkey at their meal. Now you sound like um, dad. There really is no record of the, but they didn't have turkeys in that area, and most likely a, the, the fowl that they probably had was maybe ducks, because uh, this is what they regularly consumed, was maybe ducks, maybe geese, maybe even swans. Mm-hmm. Um, so and so, I mean, things have changed and so forth. Where turkey was uh, certainly then brought in and, and everything. But going back to the 1600s, it was uh, they probably didn't have turkey. So, well, my dad said we shouldn't be eating turkey because they had fish. And I did read uh, so when I studied the history: yeah. fish and lobster. Mm-hmm. Fish and lobster. Neither one are my favorite, but uh, I will eat it if I have to. I guess if I was hungry, I would be thankful and eat it. <laughs> but the tradition in the United States has become the turkey. Uh, there's some people that think it should be the state, the uh, the uh, the bird instead of the eagle. <laughs> but I think we'll stick with the eagle. <laughs> Sometimes we deserve the turkey. But, um, you know, I live in a little turkey town because I live in a little town where there's Cargill. And uh, that's what uh, it's one of the main industries in this little town here in Mid Missouri is Cargill. When they they have turkeys, so they sell lots and lots of turkeys. And some of the vegetables that they might have had during that time and in that area might have been um, onions, beans, lettuce, spinach, cabbage, carrots, maybe even peas. Uh, of course, corn. And uh, but they, what they did is they might have removed the corn from the cob and they might have turned it into cornmeal, which was then boiled and pounded into a thick corn mush or porridge. And uh, lots of times they would sweeten it with molasses. So and some of the fruits that were indigenous to the region was of course blueberries, plums, grapes, gooseberries, raspberries, and of course cranberries. Mm. Uh, I don't think they had the cranberry. <laughs> In the can. <laughs> cranberry sauce in the can. <laughs> they didn't have the jelly cranberry sauce in the I can. I didn't hear green bean casserole in that either. They didn't either. Green, sure bean green bean casserole or what? sweet potato oh. casserole, candied sweet potatoes. Oh. I'm sure it was different, and, um, you know, uh, they had what was available. Mm-hmm. I have an old cookbook. It's not ancient, but it's, it's, a, it's an older cookbook. Um, it's called the Heritage Cookbook. And um, I don't think you can even find it anymore. But it has the recipes from, like, back in the colonial days and through to modern time as as to when that was modern time, not today, obviously. But um, And how they adapted making the foods that they were accustomed to because they had different spices, different herbs, different uh, different things here when they were in the colonies here than what they had when they were when their ancestors were overseas um, where they came from from London from overseas from Europe so anyway it was kind of interesting how how they adapted uh, with their recipes and and that's how some of those things came to be it's called the heritage cookbook I ought to take a picture of it and send it to you Great, fantastic we are going into a break We hope you're having a wonderful Thanksgiving morning. We're going to bring some things. I have a little something I want to bring to you that actually was read by Paul Harvey. And I'm going to read it to you. And I'm not sure what else the melody has. I have a little warm, fuzzy story. I got uh, lots of things. I was prepared. (laughs) She's prepared. She told me she would be. (laughs) I'm prepared, too. Anyway, we hope you're having a wonderful Thanksgiving. And keep tuning in because we have more to share with you. We just wanted to spend this hour with you. uh, And we will be right back. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. 
Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Yuji. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more, using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, cross the border, dot org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. You're listening to Power Talks with Melody and Beth Ann in the morning, and it is Thanksgiving morning, and we wanted to share with you. And I have a little, I have a little Paul Harvey here that I thought was very interesting. And then, and then we're going to talk about our our time together and Thanksgiving dinner. We're going to talk about some of that with Melody. In the medieval Dutch town of Leiden in the early 17th century, the immigrants were getting restless. There was a significant immigrant population. Even back there, back then, the people left Leiden, had a, the people of Leiden had a motto in those days. Their saying was, and I quote, Leiden refuses no honest people free entry. But this was effective, so effective that within months of its first utterance, 30% of the town of Leiden was foreign born and foreign speaking. But eventually, as I said, those immigrants grew restless. After only a little more than a decade in warm, welcoming, tolerant Leiden, the tolerated immigrants lost their own tolerance for their new home. Our children are becoming so assimilated. Too Dutch. The ungrateful immigrants began complaining about everything. Oh, we aren't getting enough jobs, they complained. And predictably... After the Dutch natives of Leiden began hearing that sort of thing, they began rethinking their original policies of open doors and open arms. No, the Dutch refused to deport the malcontent, but their individual unofficial attitudes became less hospitable. And when you see where this is going, many of the immigrants only about a half generation before had flocked to Leiden so gladly and so gratefully packed up 
and moved out to the New World. So, after they... So after the so-called pilgrims wore out their welcome in Leiden, Holland in 1620, a handful of them got into a shaky little boat, sailed across the sea to Plymouth Rock. But there was a stowaway aboard the Mayflower, and that unseen passenger was the culture of Leiden itself. For despite their relentless struggle of originality, the pilgrims brought with them to their new homes in North America a collage of customs which Americans recognize and revere to this day. The civil registration of marriage, for example, was immigrated. They, the then unique concept of separation of church and state. Also, two centuries later, Quincy Adams, John Quincy Adams would cite the Mayflower Compact as the foundation of the United States Constitution. But did he know the United Colonies, which the Pilgrims established in New England in 1643, the consolidation of sovereign independent jurisdiction into one nation? That was based on a form of federal government they first observed in the Netherlands, the United Province. And one more thing. Back in Leiden, there was a particular celebration. It was a day of commemorating the end of the Spanish siege against the city in 1574. It was sort of like our Fourth of July, but the focus of those Dutch festivities, instead of fireworks, was gratitude. Thanksgiving Day is what it was called. Yes, I do mean to say that when you're giving thanks today, say some for the people of the 17th century Leiden, whose own immigrants immigrated to our distant rocky shore, where eventually, however arduously, freedom was born. And as our beloved commentator Paul Harvey would say to us, now you know the rest of the story. I thought that was fascinating, Melody. <laughs> that is very nice. That really is. And, and I think it, go ahead. the one thing that really st- stuck out for me as I've had this conversation uh, before is that the first constitution was the Mayflower, from the Mayflower. The Mayflower Compact. Yep. It was very the first right constitution. And, um, and, of course, the, the discussion is our, our constitution was were we the people... Um, uh, I believe the, the the Mayflower Compact specifically mentions God. May I read it to you? Yes. It's very short. Yes. This is the modern version, so it doesn't have the old language in it, but it's but it's the same. In the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dead sovereign Lord King James, of the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, Defender of Faith, etc., Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith and honor our king and country, a voyage of, to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends of aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness thereof we have un hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the year of the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, and 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, 1620. Hmm. I thought Very that nice. was interesting. It Very is. Very interesting. It is. Hard to read. <laughs> Even though it was the modern version, it was hard to read. <laughs> But they were. They were acknowledging God. And, of course, they were still under the king's rule, so they acknowledged the kings from where, mm-hmm. whence they came. But they were acknowledging God and Christianity yes. and uh, standing on that. 
Very few people know that. Very few know. people know that. So. Well, we don't go back to that, and that is that was the foundation. That was kind of where the Constitution, you know, based its uh, uh, wording on as well. Yes. So it was, of course, they were not acknowledging the king at that time. Just King Jesus, not the other one. <laughs> But very nice, very nice. Thank you. I didn't write it, but thank you anyway. Uh, where do you want to go? Well, you had some fun and interesting things, so let's kind of lighten it up a little bit and go go back to uh, uh, some things that you had. We were talking about the food. Did you have a little bit more on the food? Um, that's, there's, I have a little trivia about Thanksgiving. Oh, okay, trivia. Uh oh. Did you know there was a trivia. baby born? Aboard the Mayflower? Oh, my gosh. I did know that. I had that in my history, and I don't have that with me, so I'm going to lose that one. Okay. <laughs> Your choice. It's multiple choice. Paul, Miles, Seamus, and Oceanus. You know it was like? Oceanus. Very good. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, ding. Um, before carrying the pilgrims to America, the Mayflower was a, a cruise liner, a passenger ferry, <laughs> A battleship or a wine vessel? Oh, my. A battleship? No, that was what I chose. (laughs) Well, maybe we were right. (laughs) It was a wine vessel. (laughs) It was a wine vessel. It was a wine vessel. Uh, Let's see what else is there, and then we'll move on to something else. Um, Which one of these U.S. presidents could claim Mayflower ancestry? George Washington, Gerald Ford, George H.W. Bush, Franklin Pierce. Franklin Pierce. No. George H.W. Bush. Seriously. Is a descendant of two Mayflower passengers, John Howland and Francis Cook. Other U.S. presidents with Mayflower ancestors are John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Zachary Taylor, Ulysses S. Grant, James Garfield, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and, of course, George W. Bush. It's Mm -hmm. kind of interesting, you know, when you think of the elite and you think of, you know, when people, we talk about, you know, presidents are chosen or groomed and so forth. Uh, I don't know. I always said I've been here, my my family's been here so long, I probably came over on the, on the, uh, Mayflower, but I don't know for positive that's sure. <laughs> but I've been here since the that has been here since the 1600s. I do believe the fam. And some of the trivia as far as movies, you know, because either men watch the football and sometimes, well, women do too. But you know, mm-hmm. the kids and women sometimes will watch movies and so forth. And some of the top movies, of course, you have the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. and. One of my favorites is Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. <laughs> I have not seen that. Uh, with the John Candy and Steve Martin. And I was never a Steve Martin fan. I liked Oh, John, I like Steve Martin. I like John Candy. And if you haven't watched it, you have to watch it. Okay. And okay. because it is about getting together at Thanksgiving and, you know, so forth. Grumpy old. Oh, is that where they're traveling and they, yes. get, they have to pick up somebody and take them? Well, they're traveling and they meet at the airport, and okay. they try and they're going to the same place. You know, Steve Martin is trying to get home for his family. He lives it's in a nice happened. house with his family, and and John Candy is a shower curtain salesman. The the I think he sells the the rods or the, the things that you hook onto the. He sells those, okay. and uh, he doesn't have anybody, so he kind of stalks. Steve Martin to the point where they decide to come together and try to make the trip back to I think it was just Chicago together. So they do planes, they were trains, kind of in a desperate situation, weren't they? Yeah. yeah kind of goes, a, okay, to yes, get back. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, I, funny, I might funny. have seen that once. I guess I need to watch that again. It was a 1987 movie. Funny, funny movie. You also have Grumpy Old Men. Yeah. And uh, you have other uh, comedy as uh, for greatest turkey movie of all time is Free Birds. I'm not an animated person as no, well as when I it comes, so movie. I don't know. About, but usually a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving is, uh, you know, the the one and the only for, for <laughs> children. And what did they serve on that Thanksgiving for Charlie Brown? Do you remember? 
I'm sure you do. You have five boys. <laughs> well, they had toast and popcorn. Okay. <laughs> Sounds Jacking good to me. Toast, making the popcorn. Yeah, yeah, I do like popcorn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I ought to take some this weekend. I ought to take some. Yeah, it's it's interesting what we do. Um, you know, a lot of times my family starts coming in on Wednesday evenings, and you have to, you're planning all the big feasts the next day, but you've got to plan something for that evening, something for breakfast, and then something for the Friday. And it has become a, a tradition now. My, I've got, because I've got two daughter-in-laws that are really good. Well, all of them are good cooks, but these two are, are more of a I'm not going to waste anything cook kind of person. And uh, they will take that bird and they put it in my big stock pot after we're done with the Thanksgiving dinner and cleaning up. And they will boil everything off of that, and they make a really, really good soup for the next day. And so we have, we have, you know, we don't have a lot of leftover turkey because we make turkey soup and dumplings and, and, uh, uh, vegetables and all that to go in it. And it's really good. It's really pretty good. Well, I think these numbers are wrong. This is the American Farm Bureau Federation. They said on average, Thanksgiving meal for 10 people cost about $50. Hmm. Well, I can't imagine fifty dollars for ten people. <laughs> well, I was going to say, what's the, yeah, what's the average? Um, no, but um, but there is a restaurant, Old Homestead Steakhouse, New York City, offers a Thanksgiving package that costs more than fifteen hundred times that at a total price of seventy six thousand dollars. Seventy-six for ten for a family of ten. Um. Well, that's um. Seventy-six thousand dollars. You're just not buying dinner. No, I guess this not. restaurant says you're creating <laughs> memories. I can create a whole lot of memories for seventy-six thousand. Just give me the seventy-six thousand dollars. Just give me the seventy-six thousand dollars. Memory. <laughs> it's they. They continue to say it's an experience that goes beyond just food. And uh, the old homestead executive chef Juan Luis Acosta cooks this exclusive dinner. Um, actually, they actually did cook it for CNBC. And they say when they arrive at the, the table, the restaurant's feast was showcased with Da Vinci-like beauty. Uh, the dinner it boasts everything from a 475 per pound imported Japanese wagyu beef lollipops. Oh, my gosh. Uh, to gravy infused with $3,300 special reserve Pappy Van Winkle bourbon. <laughs> they also have, so, you, you, so the dinner starts with $100 imported king oysters. And let's see what other interesting things. It has a uh, $225 per pound smoked bacon slabs that are cured from imported Japanese black boar topped with an orange marmalade glaze made from $75 decopan oranges and an $1,800 special reserve bottle of cognac. Uh, Why would anybody pay $75 for orange-made jelly? (laughs) I can buy the marmalade cheaper than that. I know. But uh, there's, a, there's a dipping sauce uh, for um, these lollipops at $475, $4,800. Hmm. Wow. Uh, the turkey is $105 per pound. What kind of turkey was that? It's from a free-range farm in upstate New York. It was basted <laughs> in... free about that. Mm, it's organic. <laughs> was basted in $17 per ounce Italian olive oil, whipped sweet potatoes, 1600 wait, whipped sweet potatoes were topped with a $1,600 per ounce black caviar, uh, mashed potatoes uh, were had a flair of $455 per pound imported Swedish I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I don't think everybody needs to hear the, you know, the dollar amounts, but... Uh, uh, but not only that, I believe uh, it comes with some great things. Uh, back in 2015, 
the dinner included a two-carat emerald-cut diamond engagement ring that was hidden in the stuffing at the base of the turkey when one customer used to propose to his girlfriend. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, you can get your trip to Japan coma a lot cheaper than $76,000. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so. So uh, crazy. That well, is just absolutely crazy. Well, there's that, a lot of billionaires in the world today where $76,000 is just chump change. Well, when my ship comes in, I'll take you to that dinner. Would you, okay. Yeah, we'll just Ladies do that. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll you heard that. <laughs> Of course, my ship has, um, I think it took the Bermuda Triangle. I'm not sure when it will get here. (laughs) But anyway, getting back to the meal, there are a lot of families that are coming together. I enjoy my family. I really do, and I have a big family, and I enjoy it. But there's a lot of people that they kind of dread getting family together or, or having to have dinner with their in-laws and that kind of thing. And uh, so we're, we've got a little something to help. Well, we had a caller on one of the programs yesterday that said, uh, you know, he, he was looking for some fire in order to battle because I think Trump will be, if you discuss politics at the dinner table, uh, it will be uh, a them against uh, um, him. Them, <laughs> yeah, them against those. And... Uh, and I came across six ways to change the subject when things get tense at Thanksgiving dinner. Mm. And you can use this for any dinner. And yes. politics is one, religious is one. You can even have it on different football teams. Maybe your college team is not doing as well as, you know, you're, or you're for a different team. You know, I'm for Pittsburgh. Most of my family's for Baltimore. I still don't know why, but... <laughs> <laughs> I guess so and I'm probably the most conservative in the fan but here's six ways to change uh, if things get tight and tense and the wine begins to flow and some topics of conversation should really be off limits Uh, some of those again will be the presidential election gun control maybe maybe gay rights Uh, there's a lot of other controversial uh, um, current events Um, so you can Change the subject when things. You can bring an older topic of conversation back. Uh, you can think of a topic from an earlier in the day. Or maybe you can act just as though you just thought of something that you meant to say. Well, you know what? I just thought of this from earlier. We do that on the program all the time. Oh, I forgot to say this uh, from earlier when we were talking. <laughs> Remember when we were talking about that earlier topic? So you can do that. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> So that's one way in which you can uh, um, change the topic. Um, flattery. Um, you know, you, oh, you can say to your aunt, oh, what a beautiful brooch you have there. Or I just noticed your bracelet. Is that new? Um, so you can always, you know, use a compliment. Blue shiny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can try and pull someone else into the conversation. You can say, um, hey, Aunt Diana, how was your trip to Spain? Or, uh, you know, bring in a new person that maybe is uh, just, you know, doesn't, is not um, joining the conversation at that point in time. You can take a key word and steer the conversation in a different direction. This classic bridging technique is used uh, lots of times in political debates, but it can work in everyday conversation as well. Um, So if someone is beginning to discuss uh, um, politics, maybe something, maybe maybe there was a a protest in Portland, and maybe you know something about Portland. Maybe you know there's a donut shop or something or or whatever. You can you can say, well. Portland, yeah. Didn't Portland uh, have that donut shop that uh, maybe you saw on the Food Network or something? You know, you know. So you can, you know, bring something up and and, uh, steer the direct conversation in a different direction. What we've been doing, Beth, for two days is talking about food. Yes, we have. (laughs) I'm kind of hungry. I don't know about you. (laughs) Yeah. You can just, uh, you know, just, oh, my gosh, I just finally tried the sweet potatoes, and, oh, that is great. What's the spice in there? And, well, and 
I will think of you tomorrow when, I mean today, <laughs> when I have my, <laughs> see, I am already lost, when I have my, my uh, green bean casserole. Okay. <laughs> I yes. will think of you. There's a little something funny that, that I had seen on, on uh, the World Wide Web, and I know it's absolutely true. But anyway, a mother was playing a joke on her daughter. Her daughter was going to be making the turkey this year, and her mother stuffed a smaller turkey inside the big turkey and then convinced her daughter <laughs> that the turkey was pregnant <laughs> oh as she was getting the turkey ready for for turkey dinner. And it, I, I know it doesn't sound funny, but it was really funny. <laughs> and it's even got it on YouTube. Her her mother filmed, the, filmed her reaction. And uh, uh, I don't know, the first... The first Thanksgiving dinner that I actually fixed by myself when I decided mom needed a, a break, and she hesitantly did it, uh, but I had the first time. Remember how nervous I was, Melody, to, it had to be perfect just like mama's, you know. Mm-hmm. The turkey had to be perfect. The gravy had to be perfect. The dressing had to be perfect. Everything had to be perfect like mom's. But I was really nervous that that particular Thanksgiving because it was, it was my turn to be the mom. Mm-hmm. It was my turn, and I have done it ever since. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it was really, and I knew mom was probably a little sad that she wasn't cooking it that year. And so I made sure that she knew that I was grateful that she let me take a chance. And, uh, and I tried to include her in the kitchen a little bit when they got there, you know, to kind of help me. But, uh, I remember how nervous I was because uh, I wanted it to be just like mom's. And I'm sure it was. It, it did turn out good. It did turn out good. It was my first time to present it to my mother. I had fixed it before, but not for mom, mm-hmm. not on Thanksgiving Day. So it was kind of kind of cool. So I, I kind of think about that and, and the stress I felt, <laughs> you know, the want to be just like mama as when this mother was playing a joke on her daughter the first time she was doing it (laughs) put a turkey inside the turkey that wasn't an easy feat either i'm going to tell you that wouldn't have been easy to do i hear music we're going into a break i hope that you are having a wonderful happy thanksgiving and if you're still traveling be careful out there and melody and beth ann will be right back hear it first on firstamendmentradio.com and firstamendmentradio.net Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately. 
and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. And we have returned. You're listening to Power Talks with Melody and Beth Ann in the morning. And it is Thanksgiving morning. Um, and we uh, are so glad to be here with you during this hour. I hope you're enjoying our silly talk and our poems and our our history that we've brought to you. I have I have a couple of daughter-in-laws that are teachers, Melody, mm-hmm. and I plan on sharing this with one of them. I will be with one of them this afternoon, and I'm planning on making her cry because she cries very easily. But this one even brought tears. And you I, meanie. Yeah, I, I know. It's I love to see her get emotional. Um, but this is a teacher's story, and it says here, this will make your Thanksgiving. Now, one thing I have done in the past, I don't do it every time, but in the past I have handed out pieces of paper to the children, to the grandchildren and the children, the adults and the children, and have them put briefly what they're thankful for, kind of like the show we did yesterday. Mm-hmm. What are you thankful for? And if the children are small, they can just draw a picture you know, on it, and then pass those around and have somebody else read them, and do that before you say the prayer for the meal, and do that before you eat the meal. Well, the teacher did something like that. This is Mrs. Klein, and she told her first graders to draw a picture of something for which they were thankful. She thought about how these children who lived in deteriorating neighborhoods actually had to be thankful for. What is it they have to be thankful for? She knew that most of the class would draw pictures of turkeys or bountiful laden Thanksgiving tables. And that was what they believed was expected of them. What took her aback was Douglas's picture. Douglas was a forlorn little boy, likely to be found close to her shadow all the time as they went outside to recess. Douglas was drawing was simply this, a hand. Obviously, but whose hand? The class was captivated by his image. I think it must be the hand of God. That brings us food, said one student. A farmer, said another, because they grow the turkeys. It looks more like a policeman, and they protect us, I think, said Lavina. That is supposed to uh, be all the hands that help us. But Douglas could only draw one of them. Mrs. Klein had almost forgot about Douglas in her pleasure of finding the class's responses. When she had the others back to work on their project, she bent over his desk and she asked, Whose hand is this, Douglas? And Douglas mumbled, It's yours, teacher. Then Mrs. Klein recalled that she had taken Douglas by the hand from time to time. She often did that with children, but but that it meant so much to Douglas. And now she realized, perhaps she reflected that was her Thanksgiving and everybody's Thanksgiving, not the material things given to us, but the small ways that we sometimes give to others. And he drew a hand because his teacher took his hand and it meant so much to him. I just thought that was the neatest little story about, are you crying? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just thought that was the that is very nice. story. That is uh, very nice. That, uh, you know, you never know. People think children don't pay attention, but they do. Mm-hmm. And we never know what someone else is going through. And here we are heading into this 
this holiday season, Christmas starts today, you know, the Black Friday. They can't wait till Friday. they got to start, start it right after Thanksgiving dinner. And um, I won't go to those things. I will not oh. go out and shop. I've got some daughter-in-laws that do. They say they can get their shopping all done. You know, it's, uh, it's extreme shopping, power shopping. But um, they have a list and they follow that. They don't just go crazy. But um, to think about the small things and... and uh, what really is special and a lot of times we do something with the children when the others are out shopping you know either go to a movie or or put a movie in or or do something with the kids i'm hoping on my on my the seed this afternoon i'm hoping we have time to do a little craft or something with the kids um, whether it's just drawing turkeys using your hand or whatever, you know, because I've got all all ages. Um, I don't have all the grandchildren together this year, just be part of them. But uh, I think, uh, you know, I like to have a little something for them to do. And and uh, I like to see their faces light up when they tell you what they're thankful for and they think about it. Sometimes they'll give you the answer that you expect, like, well, turkey and food, gosh, yes, or cranberry out of a can. But <laughs> I don't know if if you've done this, but my family, my cousin, she, they've had two boys. Mm-hmm. One's 24 and the other one is uh, 19. And at Thanksgiving on the table, when they were younger, they would write what they were thankful. And mm-hmm. then what she does, she places on the tables now. Every year, she'll bring out different... Uh, reports. She'll bring out things from their childhood that, uh, and when they wrote on Thanksgiving, what they were thankful for, and oh, then I she'll was just not that organized. Yeah, she would. She would come out and, uh, you know, and then we sit there after dinner and we read them and, you know, share what they were thankful for when, you know, when they were itty bitty, and uh, oh my gosh, this 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 woman, I'm so impressed with her. She is so organized. We went to dinner with some of her classmates, and she saved up the class notes that you pass back and forth in oh my. school? They were all her children. They were all her children. Uh, I can't say that I was ever that organized oh, as a mother. I'm so impressed with Or a grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they had the books, you know, we're supposed to keep for the first year, and I never mm-hmm. could keep up with that. I, I want to share a Thanksgiving poem before we close. This is by Edward Guest. It says, Getting together to smile and rejoice, and eating and laughing with folks of your choice. And kissing the girls and declaring that they are growing more beautiful day after day. Chatting and bragging a bit with the men. Building the old family circle again. Living the wholesome and old-fashioned cheer. Just for a while at the end of the year. Greetings fly fast as we crowd through the door. And under the old roof we gather once more. Just as we did when the youngsters were small, mothers a little bit grayer, that's all. Fathers a little bit older, but still ready to romp and to laugh with a will. Here we are back at the table again, telling our stories as women and men. Bowed are our heads for a moment in prayer. Oh, but we're grateful and glad to be there. Home from the East Lands and home from the West. Home with the folks that are dearest and best. Out of the sham of the cities afar, we've come for a time to be just what we are. Here we can talk of ourselves and be frank, forgetting position and station and rank. Give me the end of the year and it's fun, when most of the planning and toiling is done. Bring all the wanderers home to the nest. Let me sit down with the ones I love best. Hear the old voices still ringing with song. See the old faces unblemished by wrong. See the old table with all of its chairs. And I'll put soul in my Thanksgiving prayers. And that's by Edward Guest. I thought that was a pretty neat poem. Pretty good verbal word description of what we think of it. Thanksgiving dinner. When you're all sitting around, you have to bring, bring out every kind of chair you've got, maybe put a folding table at the end of the table, or kids are in the kitchen and the adults are in the dining room, and and uh, you you can be yourself. You don't have to be someone else. You're, you're in the company that everybody knows who you are. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of a neat little poem. 
It really was, and it kind of took you there to that table, and it kind of took you there. And, and I think that's why I love Thanksgiving so much. It's, it's, it's the one holiday where it takes you back in time. Yes. You have a connection to time, to, to mm. all the experiences that you've um, with your grandparents and your aunts and your uncles, because it, cause you do all come together, not even so much Christmas. But Thanksgiving is one because at Thanksgiving everyone is appreciative of each other, even though you might have some tense topics at the dinner table but it's <laughs> or at the football game afterwards. But it's still a time of coming together in prayer and in thanks and memories. Thanksgiving but is a, a holiday at, of memories. If you're still lucky enough to have your parents, you're looking oh, across the table and you, uh, you uh, see the... The wrinkles on their faces. Uh, I no longer have my parents with me. I don't so either. I, I, I miss them. I do too. But now I'm the parent and the grandparent that they stare across the table and look at the wrinkles. <laughs> Beth, and, you don't uh, have any wrinkles, as I, I don't either. No, of course we don't. <laughs> of course we don't. <laughs> Especially when we take that trip to Pan in. <laughs> anyway, our hour's almost over, and we really, really enjoy being with you and wanted to spend this hour today with you and i hope that you enjoyed it hope you enjoyed our levity our poems our our silliness and visit crossthborder.org c-r-o-s-s crossthborder.org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's crossthborder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures? and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border dot org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org the book of revelation says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of jesus christ this is at the very heart of firstamendmentradio.com in that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern 
or 1 p.m. Pacific time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.